Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good morning from Fiji. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening from wherever you're tuning in this morning. My name is Viva Tatawanga, and I'm from Diva for Equality Fiji, and I will be co-moderating with my colleague Sanam. Uh, I will uh, let Sanam introduce herself, and I'll give the floor back to her. But it's my honorable task this morning is to welcome you all into the space. We hope that you are excited as much as we are for this uh, session. And maybe just before we get into the session, we will share a screen just to share with you a few guidelines, right? What we always say in Diva, we don't need rules because um, we are old enough and we know our, whatever we're doing. But this guideline is just to help us through this session. Um, there is a power board, uh, fireball room you have with us this morning. So we want to make sure that at the end of this session, everybody will go back with something constructive or something that will help the work that they're doing. So we hope these guidelines will kind of help that uh, go well for us. Eh? So please, as I mentioned earlier, feel free to rename and uh, rename yourself from your gadget. So you might be coming in as Galaxy or Samsung. We're sure that's not your name. So feel free to rename yourself, put down your preferred pronoun. And also, please, um, if you, want to share, share some resources from the work that you do, the chat, we are, uh, we, we are very clear that you can, uh, yes, we've been affirmed that you can share resources on the chat and just flagging, we have interpreters and I also have to remind myself this, so please talk slowly and I'm also flagging to the speakers and uh, slowly and very clear so they are able to capture you. Uh, just flagging that the session will be recorded and feel free, the last one will be feel free to switch off video if network coverage is weak. For some of us, most of us that come from South countries, this is one of the biggest problem of, for us in tuning in into this kind of platform. So there are some techniques that we can do to still enable us to participate fully in this platform. So feel free to switch off video or mute yourself if you're not talking uh so we can still have this uh, conversation eh? so those are some of the guidelines that we we hope that you can abide with, with us to make sure that we have a very constructive and productive conversation eh? so i will thank, thank you katie for that um just to take you through the, the brief instruction at uh, the introduction about this session welcome to the south south conversation series and this first session is actually focusing in sweeping up the dirt under the mat, right? You have feminists, you have women's human rights defenders with you this morning as speakers, that they will talk to you about how are we really actually moving forward, right? Knowing that promoting a structural and anti-colonial uh, and intersectional approach to social, economic, climate justice or as we move forward from a realities of the work that we all do from our, our region, right? So with you this morning, you have Diva for Equality as the conveners, the Ganga Grassroots Young Feminist Network, Women Defend the Commons, Poverty to Power and Pacific Feminist SRHR, co-lead with Tonga Women's and Children's uh, Center, Shifting the Power Coalition, Pacific Islands Feminist Alliance for Climate Justice, Action Aid Vanuatu, Peng and Wansawara, and also Pacific Islands Climate Action Network with the Feminist Action Nexus for Economic and Climate Justice. So together we provide this, this space to make sure that you know how are we talking about all these things that we keep hearing that in the movement, we keep hearing from every work that we're doing that human rights CSO spaces are getting closer. How are we talking about all these unspoken realities in the challenges of you know moving this work forward? And we're not clear like who instead of pushing the blame back and forth, how do we create such a space that we can have this kind of constructive and healthy conversation? So we hope that you will uh, enjoy what the speakers will unpack with you this morning, which is about unpacking the commodification of human rights, right? And the development, how do we move forward with that? As for me, as the grassroots young women's net, uh, young woman uh, organizer, I'm so excited to really if we are about moving forward and not leaving anyone behind, then we need to really scrap out some of this patriarchal behavior that we still sometimes unintentionally still enabling. We need to move the conversation to that. So we're hoping 
that this platform that we are creating for you this morning will enable some of those discussions, the different actors, the different parts that everyone plays in this, uh, uh, this work that we are all trying to do. And also building up this conversation into the conference of parties, the COP27. How do we, for us to be enabled, to be able to go into this space and really have a South, a strong South voice that we really want to make our point, then we need to make sure that we scrap out all these things that we need to put on the table to enable us, even if it's not COP or other uh, platform that we are trying to example, like CSW, all these other uh, global spaces that we're trying to engage in, how do we, and most of the time, how do we engage specifically and for some of the spaces without dealing with some of the issues that we still carry with us? And some of these issues, actually, the issues that you know close us up from engaging, close us up from how when we're supposed to be all standing together, we all at some points always go in with different ways. So we're hoping that you will enjoy this series, and we hope that you will, as much as we are learning from this platform, you also uh, as much as you're learning from this platform, we are also going to be learning from each other. Without further ado, I will now give it to Sanam to introduce our speakers, and we'll go straight into it. Thank you, Viva, for this powerful introduction. And before we throw it over to our amazing speakers, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is clear on how to access the interpretation options. Today, we have English, uh, French, and Spanish channels. Okay. So just switching back and um, making sure that everybody can hear in the language that they prefer, um, because I think we're going to have an incredible, powerful conversation today. And we are um, also just so thrilled. I was just saying as we were starting that this is going to be a historical conversation because we've brought together such powerful voices who have been doing incredible labor in the Pacific. And then we've invited our wonderful sisters in Africa to stay up till midnight so that they can also share and connect and respond on that. So as Viva has mentioned, we'll have a 45 minute block to have that inter-Pacific conversation and then we'll hear from our African sisters. And um, we do have a video from one of our uh, uh, wonderful speakers who wasn't able to join exactly in this time block. So what we've agreed is that we'll let y'all free flow and um, let out what's in your hearts and, and, and what you're carrying with you, both the learning and the joy and, um, the, and, and the, the hurt and, and the burden. Um, but I'll give you a break as emotionally as well as physically in, at the 20 minute mark and we'll uh, play that video from Sharon and then resume the conversation. So with that, I wanna invite uh, Noeline and Joey to kick us off. And of course uh, we have uh, our other uh, uh, activists in, in the ch uh, joining us as well, Alpha and, and others who um, you, can, you can speak to and sort of just Keep, keep the conversation rolling as you like. So Noeline, all over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Sanam. And um, those who know me know I've been waiting for this for a long time. Um, so yeah, I am, I, it's funny, I am a little emotional. One of the reasons why is I think we find ourselves, you know, I was thinking about this really great, both. I love the series title and I love the, the session title eh? that accountability is not a metaphor and sweeping out the dirt under the mat. There's so much dirt under the mat that it's bulging. It gets harder and harder to stand on. It's hard to sit on. I'm 54 years old now, so I might be a bit calmer in, you know, speaking and responding to some of these things. But I also was thinking that for me, like the rage is even deeper now. It's like little daggers um and and that's okay it's just that we then have to work out you know what do we do with that um and we're dealing with just so much loss and damage now you know there's so many people around me right now for instance just a practical example who are suffering from vector-borne um, diseases and there's just so much of it around far more than we've ever dealt with um, and as the, you know, as the trajectory of global warming continues, um, 
this is going to keep happening. Um, and so we're doing normal life goes on, everyday life goes on, but we're dealing with all of these changes to our ecology and to our bodies um, and the way they interact. So, you know, anytime there's commodification or marketization of development around me, or I feel the racism or yeah, directed at me or others, when, when we facing like elitism and stigma and there's all this geopolitical play that's always been there, but it becomes even heightened because people are in fear um, right now. It's not easy to handle without anger. So, and then, you know, it's quite fascinating. Every day there's a new lesson in this. So um, I'm looking through this really global program of events. Eh? And then in the, in the, the plenary that's being discussed on colonialism or coloniality, um, in the text we're being told to play nice to call people in not to call them out and and for me that's where this begins is if you cynically take space or you harm people in your work or your life or the system then you're going to get called out it's justice and and we seem to be doing more this you know this um this set of work that says, yeah, call me out, but don't really call me out. Just do it in a nice way, do it in a kind way. We all need to be kind in our lives. But the problem is, is that this system and the people who are benefiting from it, they continue to do what they do. And for me, it's like, you can't, grace comes with accountability. There's no growth without wisdom. So if you're gonna get called out, you're gonna get called out. That's part of life. And I think I, I find it very difficult to hear it when it's very, very close in our movements as well. Because just like any other movement, we're a mirror of you know the world. So we have heterocapitalists, we have the panderers to patriarchy in our movement as everywhere. So that's tiring. Um, and, and so this idea about accountability is not a metaphor. Well, neither is universality of human rights. We don't get to pick and choose who is right and who is not, um, who, who applies um, and and the same applies therefore to decolon uh, decoloniality and and the more that we think and we don't talk about our pacific social structures about the systems that are in place about the ways we think the epistemologies of this particularly of this past two centuries we really have been about what's come from the imperialist guns, germs, and steel period, right? We're not even close to opening up and dealing with our past and our present that comes from our past. We've got a school book in Fiji that illustrates it, Fiji, the land and the people. It's so reformist. And yet it's the most popular book in education that we've had in Fiji. The last time I read it, it actually made me feel ill because there's nothing of any consequence in it that is about the reality of what we've lived through. But it's been taught in every classroom for decades since, since independence. So the next thing is about the way that we generationally carry on with these things, the local elites who formed the first two generations of our new countries. So now when things are bad and we need a shift, people call back to the old as if it's what we need. When really, often the new state is just really old, ugly flowers in a new vase. You know, this is the truth of it. We have some new beauty emergent, but it is often crushed by that which is old and we don't want to leave behind. We've had multiple coups over decades. They're still about, they've always been about patriarchy and racism and elitism. We learned those through ancient and colonial times. And they're now then encoded in these capitalist and nationalist and, and fascist terms. Lots of weird kind of half, half, um, well, I call them Frankensteinian um, institutions. They're a cross between kind of British stuffy white nonsense and then the new world toxic masculinist brown nonsense. And when they go, people feel nostalgia as if they were ours. But who are we, these people who are trying to kind of talk about justice and, and, and love, beloved community and human rights for all? Um, and if we want to undo it, it's such hard work because the capitalism is the thing that leads, for instance, to one of our largest hospitals being privatized just now with no public fuss, a colonial sport that's so important that a convicted rapist is released by a government to play rugby games under the horrified eyes of everybody, everybody, especially feminists. 
the coloniality of the Judeo-Christian church, the way it has such hegemony in Fiji and the Pacific and the majority South. Well, the church came as an arm of the British crown in our case. It colonized in another way. And it left us with this really internalized cultural and social cringe and a really fear-based religiosity. And that results in homophobia and transphobia and in a lot of bigotry that we see today. As much as we have the beauty of who we are in the Pacific, we also have so much that is a guilt inducing fear and intolerance, wiping away all of the beautiful fluidity that we've had in our gender systems, norming boundaries of woman and man, disappearing any of the gender diversity, cutting women's power, especially sexual and reproductive power and leaving a masculinist fa uh, fascism. When I look at the things that really kind of confound me today, it's 50% unmet contraceptive need and maybe even more now through COVID. Women who work three to five times as hard as men every day on unpaid care, domestic and communal work. We've got, we've got some, of, some of our governments don't even have one, gov one woman in them. Outrageous that any Pacific government with no representation of half the population dares to call themselves democratic. But then when you look out at the world, you can say it's also outrageous that any government from the G7 and G20, including USA, UK, Europe, Australia, who refuses to change when the alternative is destruction of our biosphere, of the Holocene, it's insanity. And these governments protect and enable the 10% of elites of the world's rich polluting interests. They cause 50% of the world's carbon emissions. They protect BlackRock and Monsanto, the religious right, Big Pharma. They justify vulture capitalism, these unjust debts that everybody is having to pay now, even through a pandemic. When they refuse to share their technology and vaccines, much less climate finance with us. So we are very clear on the level of racism. So when they say that they're frightened about being held responsible, oh, we already hold you responsible. This is not a new knowledge. We know you and you know us. So we should get on with it. And I see people use the word fascist a lot now as we're, you know, in the left movements, I want to substitute the word patriarchal because we have to know the source of the pain that we're going through. This is a masculinist war on ecological systems from the smallest ecosystem to the planetary ecosphere. And yes, many of us as women, we're also implicated. But all men perpetrate these systems and they benefit. White men, older and educated, most of all, but elite brown men too. And all men who treat women as unpaid labor and objects for power play and use. And white men, women too. Everybody benefits, even the halfway decent men. I've taught thousands of sessions of SojiSec over the years, and almost without exception, the first question from a man will be, what about the men who face GBV? So I repeatedly say on rote, the figures show that over 90% of the, the victim and survivors of intimate partner violence are women. Over 95% of the perpetrators of GBV are men. The structural violence of misogyny and patriarchy make these systems dangerous and deadly for all of us, worse for anyone who's seen outside these norms. So then we have to get into the conversation of what do you do personally? What about your construction of self as a man? How do you shift that? How do you work on both the material every day and the structural change we have to do? And we try and remind them that they're also hostage to capitalist heteropatriarchy. And then the, the last point maybe I'll make for now, Sanam and Viva, is about skin color politics. There's so many kinds, the ridiculous colonial phrases of Melanesian, Polynesian, Micronesian, as if it wasn't a racist French colonial invention to divide up the region. But there's a particularly awful manifestation in our region, white supremacy, it's alive and well here as elsewhere. Ask yourself how many rooms you're in where white people wear the salu salu, where they sit in the front reserve rows, where they take formal seating in regional conferences while the locals squeeze in the back, where they confidently take up space as if it's owed. How many executive officers and advisors still are white? So many. Of course, we contest it. We push our way in, we push our way through, we make our way to eyeline all of those who hold formal power, but that bears an intellectual, emotional, an action burden of resistance. It scars and it diminishes us over time. And it's tough the longer you've been doing it. For women, the leadership question is so tiresome and accountability is so low. Take PIFs, 
in our region. None of the current senior management are women, not one. Two other case start studies. So many young white volunteers come into the region, do two to three years with a crop agency, go home and then are leapfrogged to return as a regional advisor, leapfrogging right over the hardworking local with the ex excellent experience, the contacts and the skills. Not, not understanding that your ease of movement in government spaces is a false signal that we still need help, that we are not capable of experimenting, of decolonizing, that we are not worth building in terms of our own capacities. I also think that expatriate culture itself is a way to dampen, to stop the revolution from beginning to take root, to keep the focus on development and not justice, not civilizational shifts. But the cloth is falling away from the eyes of many of us who work on economic, ecological, and climate justice, and we're determined to rip it away. Fast or slow, it's happening. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. There's a lot more. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've just unleashed a dam right there. And I, I, won't, I won't pause that conversation at all, but sort of throw it to Joey. And um, I think there's a lot of resonance there of uh, experience uh, across the global south, I would say. So Joey, over to you. Thank you very much. And how do you start after Noelin? How can I? I cannot go any better than what Noelin has set the pace at. But a very good morning from Suva, uh, Dubai Namuna, uh, Maori, everyone. So honored to be part of this, this conversation um, where we're trying to um, highlight things rather than sweeping them under the mat, it's raising, a, a spotlighting some of these issues where we're so used to reserving them. Let's have a conversation about it later on. I wanted to talk about the issue of some of the other work that Young Solora and Pang does with uh, some of the indigenous groups, but some of the, our churches that are still under uh, colonial rule. But I thought it was really important in lead up to COP um, is to bring it back to this part of the region and focus more on the ocean. Um, over the time, over the years, we've been, we've had uh, conversations around how we see our region, uh, but we are really at a crucial time. Uh, the Pacific is 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 heavily contested. We've had numerous meetings between our Pacific leaders and other external partners. We've had numerous visits by our sheriffs from the region, i.e. Australia and New Zealand. Once we had new governments, we, we saw foreign ministers travel in and out. Um, recently, our leaders met with the US president. Uh, there is now a call for South Korea to have a, um, uh, a meeting with our, our leaders from the region. Uh, also noting, we also have the Palm Summit. So these are increasing conversations that our leaders seem to be engaging with, uh, being invited to, and it really tells you about, it gives a very clear picture about the geopolitics at play and how this region uh, has the greatest interest, or rather is, is, is heavily contested. There's this whole battle with China in the Pacific as well. Uh, but as we, you know, as we move on as a region, and more interestingly, there is this growing interest uh, in our ocean and its resources. Um, over the years, we've been seen as these smaller, fragile island states, submerging states. Yes, we are. Um, and then we are also known as these large ocean states. Draw us back to history. We've had this region has come through some really, really brutal uh, bloody crisis. Uh, a region that has con continuously been seen as a testing ground, one that has gone through the likes of nuclear testing. Um, we, we were seen as this vast ocean that could soak up anything. So, yeah, it was fair enough to do nuclear testing in some of our islands then under colonial rule, uh, namely the Marshall Islands, uh, Mororua in Mauhi Nui, French occupied Polynesia, um, and Kiritimati Island in uh, Kiribati. These states then, you know, were under colonial rule and had, had experienced that vast impact. Yet, to this date, whereas independent states, our, our, our people are still debating and still negotiating compensation. Many had gone through nuclear testing those times. Many were displaced 
taken off the islands, such as the Runidom. Fast forward today, we're in a crisis where we're told our ocean has vast resources, where we need to mine these resources to um, respond to climate change. We need to assist um, this, this global push for green revolution. Um, also after COVID, we have so many narratives arising such as your, your ocean resources could you know, resurrect or revive some of your economies after the whole lockdown. Um, and again, everything's just made reference to this vast blue um, co continent. We're at a very um, crucial time where our oceans are currently at threat. 